Hello there and welcome to this edition of Adipec Energy Dialogues, a series of conversations that we're bringing you in the run-up to Adipec 2020, Adipec Virtual in November 2020. We're all looking forward to that. I'm Ethna Trainer, your moderator for this session. And in this series, we are really talking to experts from around the world and the region, looking at what's going on in the oil market, and indeed looking at the wider focus in terms of what's happening in the wider industry. So I'm absolutely delighted today that I'm joined by Robin Mills. He is the CEO of Kamar Energy. And Robin, of course, an expert in the oil sector, based here in the Middle East, looking at the region, but indeed has a great global catch in terms of what's going on here. So let me just start with that. Welcome, Robin, of course. If I can firstly ask you to give me your take in terms of really the state of the market at the moment where you see the oil market right now. Well, look, I think if we take a slightly longer term view, it's remarkable you know, where we are given the collapse in, in oil demand that we had earlier this year. And, and uh, most of that or a large part of that's still not fully recovered. So, you know, since early June, oil prices have been remarkably stable. Brent just kind of hovering in, in, in the lower 40s, um, creeping up a little bit uh, over, over the past few weeks, uh, a little bit towards 45. But I mean, really, when you consider the, the turbulence, you know, to have almost now three months of, of prices that are very stable um, is quite remarkable. And I think if you look even at the increase in prices, I mean, the dollar has been a bit weaker recently. Um, if you look at the, price, the oil price in euros, you'll see it's almost a, a flat line for, for three months. Um, so that, that's kind of remarkable. And that's a bit of a testament to the, the success of the OPEC plus agreement in cutting production very sharply. Um, and so partly counterbalancing this, this enormous drop in demand that we had. Now, of course, OPEC plus is starting to ease its cuts from August onwards uh, as, as planned. Um, and the, uh, the, uh, ministerial committee meeting earlier in August uh, reaffirmed that those that process of easing cuts would go forward. But there's also a big pressure on the countries that didn't comply fully before, uh, and particularly on Iraq, Angola and Nigeria, to, that they should fully comply and in fact over comply um, in August and September to try to make up for what they didn't, didn't do earlier. And I think that, that uh, a little bit of that will be achieved, that over compliance, but probably to be honest, not, not a lot. Um, but nevertheless, this is meant that you know, demand is recovering in some parts of the world and, uh, and the OPEC uh, plus production is also coming back on the market. And these two factors are more or less in balance now uh, and, and so have combined to keep prices still very stable. Um, but obviously OPEC plus is still 7.7 uh, .7 million barrels per day below their, their original baseline. That's an you know, enormous uh, historic level of cuts, particularly over this period of time. And, and they will have to look in, in later this year and into 2021 into how do they regain market share, how do they get back to a, let's say, normal level of production? Um, that obviously depends very much on demand and the demand picture is still pretty cloudy. I think um, in some parts of the world it's improving, but obviously we, we continually see resurgences of the coronavirus uh, in areas that have thought that they've got it under control. If you look at France, Italy, and we've had it coming back. Obviously the US has been through a very severe, whether you call it a second wave or, or part of the first wave, that's maybe easing a bit, but still uh, came back very, very badly. When we look at what's going on in the demand picture, we've had many analysts on the energy dialogues and had a big conversation recently about the fact that, you know, have we seen peak demand? You know, we're looking at demand coming back and we even look at the IEA projections and the OPEC projections and saying that they're not expecting that demand to come back, you know, perhaps not until the end of 21, maybe even 22. And then many analysts are actually saying it might never come back. I mean, we look at, we have to look around the world and we have to look at longer term, medium, longer term energy demand projections. What do you think in terms of when the demand might come back? And indeed, how important is it for all of the producers that we do see demand coming back, even if it's a little bit longer than we might hope for? Yeah, you know, this is, it's, a, it's a tricky one, of course. But look, I think the, this coronavirus episode and the economic damage it's done is obviously going to have a profound impact on, on oil demand and, and already has in the short term. Some of this is demand that is just turned off and, and can be turned back on again. But some of it is longer term damage. You know, we're seeing the projections that the, the aviation industry in particular won't recover uh, to 2019 levels until 2023 or four. Um, and that's, you know, seven and a half million barrels per day of, of oil consumption normally out of, out of 100 million total. So, uh, so not, not insignificant when that's down you know, by two thirds or so. Um, I, I personally don't think we've seen peak demand, um, but I do think that this episode has brought peak demand forward. You know, it'll happen earlier than it would have, early, would have, would have happened, uh, and it'll be at a lower level um, you know, when, whenever the peak is. 
Um, but I do think over the next few years, it probably will, will surpass the, the 2019 level of about 100 million barrels per day, but maybe not surpass it by too much. I think the economic stimulus plans, recovery plans in Europe will go very heavily on electric vehicles, um, possibly in the US too, obviously, depending what happens in the, in the November election. Um, and, uh, and, and if electric vehicles are taken up increasingly, then obviously that's, that's going to reduce uh, the, the peak demand and, and bring it forward. So instead of looking at the mid 2030s as projections did have it, uh, we might be looking at peak demand in the late 2020s. Uh, and this is pretty important, you know, because when OPEC plus, as I said, has cut uh, now currently 7.7 .7 million barrels per day against their baseline. Um, under normal times, you know, when oil demand is growing one or one and a half million barrels per day each year, so you talk about five years to recover that kind of a loss. Um, and if we're getting into a, closer to a peak demand world where oil demand growth is slower, it could be even longer. So you know, that, that's, that's quite a challenge in terms of regaining that lost market share. And of course, when we look at, you know, one of the, the focus elements, of course, that OPEC is looking at, you know, stability in prices, we can almost say we've had stable prices for a few months now, but not really at the level that the producers want. And as you said, that prolonged you know, dullness in demand is going to cause a little bit of an issue on that one. Talk to me about that price level. It's tough. I mean, can they survive at this price level? And, you know, is there any way out of this, do you think? Yes, as you say, it's tough, Look, but it really depends on the producer. If you look at the, um, some of the wealthy Gulf states, if you look at uh, the UAE, for example, you know, they can survive it in the low 40s. It's not comfortable. Um, yes, it demands some tough choices. It'll mean drawing down reserves and so on, but, but it's survivable. Um, if you look at Russia, Russia's budget pre-crisis was meant to balance at $42 a barrel. So, uh, and the ruble depreciation helps Russia as well. So Russia also can, can cope with this. Uh, then there are some countries that, of course, are far more exposed. If you look at Venezuela, you look at Nigeria, Iraq, um, you know, all those countries um, face big trouble from, from a price at these levels if, it, if it's sustained. I mean, this is a lot better than, you know, $20 a barrel where we were uh, back in April. But uh, it's still, a, it's still a big challenge. Um, but on the other hand, you know, I think they don't want to keep and they shouldn't want to keep all prices. Um, uh, they shouldn't want all prices to increase too much um, without regaining market share. I mean, for me, the critical thing is to try to get back to uh, pretty much the, the 2019 level of production, which of course was already cut from, from maximum capacity, to get back to that level without crashing the price. So if the price is 45, 50, something like that, um, but they, they shouldn't have the price running away and uh, b but still not be easing their cuts. But of course, as soon as that price begins to edge up, I mean, we've seen a lot of oil taken off the American market. You know, some of the shale companies actually publicly declaring that they're not going to put that oil back out there and in the foreseeable future. But once again, when that price does creep up a little bit, are we not going to see greater production from the US? And again, we look at those figures. They're down, I believe, around 10 million barrels, even lower a day in terms of production, can America get back up or will they want to? And then of course, I suppose it's not really up to us. We're looking at a, an election looming large. So that could also have an issue in terms of will that production come back or will it not? But a higher price will surely help the competition from the US. Yes, look, and I think that's, that's the danger indeed. And, and if we look at, you know, the, the US recount in mid-August had gone down to the lowest level since 1940. Kind of amazing, really. Um, but in the, the week after that, the, the recount is actually increasing again. So I think even at these prices, you're saying there are some companies who can put rigs to work. And certainly if prices get beyond 50 or so, we'll see more activity. Not a lot of activity in the US, but, but, but more. Um, so I think that's a difficult balance for OPIC Plus to strike. And that's why I say their priority should be really regaining market share rather than trying to push prices well above 50 or, or $60 per barrel. If price goes above 60, you know, we'll definitely see a lot more US activity. But I think at the current level, you know, oil prices, uh, uh, oil prices where they are now, you know, we'd expect U.S. production to, to recover up to about the third quarter. And, and a lot of that has already happened. A lot of companies, uh, Conoco and so on, have brought back most of the, the production that they previously shut in. Um, we've got a couple of storms blowing through the Gulf of Mexico at the moment that may, may temporarily in, interrupt that. Um, but then in the, uh, back in the fourth quarter, if prices haven't recovered a lot, we'll see U.S. production starting to fall again because of the, uh, the natural declines in wells if there isn't a lot of new drilling. And, and really, we'll need to see U.S. prices you know, above, well above 50 and probably above 60 to see really strong activity and to see U.S. shell production growing again. If U.S. shell production is, is continuing to fall uh, in the longer term, obviously, that does help OPEC a bit. That creates a bit more space for them.
But of course, that's got a knock-on impact on the international oil companies, and particularly the big U.S. companies. And we look even this week, we saw, you know, here in August, um, Exxon made an exit uh, from the Dow Jones. Um, a lot of dynamics happening in the industry. I mean, obviously, given the situation at the moment, the results are not looking great from any of the companies. I think that's to be expected. But we have that big shift this year from BP in terms of going to net zero. There's a lot going on with the oil companies here. Are they in their own transition um, as they approach and gear up to, to handle the energy transition, so to speak? What do you see? Yeah, I thought the results were extremely interesting, right? So we saw the US companies' uh, results were very bad um, and, uh, you know, just consecutive quarterly losses for Exxon, which is, uh, you know, pretty much a record. Um, the European company results, of course, were not great, and that's not surprising in this low oil price environment, but they were, you know, not, not as bad as they might have been. And actually, um, before uh, exceptional items, most of the European oil companies actually managed to make a small profit, and they were really buoyed up by, by their trading results. So in a very volatile trading environment, a lot of contango earlier in the year, the traders were able to do very well, and that, that, that bailed out the, the upstream divisions. And also the European companies are not nearly as exposed to shale uh, as, as the Americans, of course. So BP a little bit more than, than the others, but, but Chevron and Exxon, obviously far bigger shale divisions than the Europeans. Uh, and that also weighed on them. I think, you know, you see shale, you know, relatively high cost of production, high decline rates, and, and very hard to justify new drilling. Whereas the, uh, the more traditionally in P for the, the Europeans uh, with long, longer, uh, uh, longer field lives and so on held up a bit better in this environment. Uh, so that's a pretty interesting division. I think the BP announcement, yes, was very important. Um, announcing the, uh, uh, kind of reaffirming the, the net zero goal by 2050, which actually several oil companies, uh, such as Total, also have now. Um, but also saying that their oil production, oil and gas production, would fall by about 40% by 2030. Um, and that's kind of really largely you know, natural declines and, and, and divestments. But um, affirming that, that their desire or their intention to shift towards a much more of a balance of new energies, you know, so obviously particularly renewables. Um, Total, again, has, has goals like that, 50% of its production to be electricity by 2030 instead of oil and gas. Um, so it would become a, a hybrid electricity oil company rather than, rather than a pure oil firm. Um, again, that's a huge shift to try to make over the space of 10 years. You'd think a very difficult one to make organically and, and one that might well mean they have to make some more sizable acquisitions. Uh, and I think, you know, look at Shell, Equinor, Repsol, you know, e &I, they've all announced a similar kind of low carbon goals. They have offshore wind projects and, and, and they have offshore uh, wind to hydrogen projects now. So a lot of, a lot of experimentation in this new energy space. The, again, the American companies, um, the bigger ones, still um, pretty, pretty much sticking to the traditional oil and gas. Um, the interesting exception, I think, is Occidental. You know, Occidental obviously made the big acquisition out of Darko. That is unfortunately time for them with the, the price crash. It's, it's really weighed on them. Um, but they did announce a very interesting project recently, the world's largest uh, project for direct air capture of carbon dioxide. Um, and that I think will be a very important technology for all the oil companies. So uh, interesting uh, and important commitment by Oxy there. Now, indeed, and you've written a book about carbon capture. So just as you've segued into that, it's the, the very important question too, and it's, it's the perfect timing for it. This has been something we've been hearing about for years. Um, you know, who's going to get it right? Is it, is it moving? Is it progressing? And do you see it as, you know, just part of the answer or something that absolutely all of the oil companies really need to get on board with because they have to look towards a greener future? Yeah, look, for me, it's absolutely essential, both on a global uh, side and, and for the oil companies. You know, if you look at the scenarios for trying to reduce carbon dioxide emissions really quickly, as we now have to do, um, for me, there's not, I mean, for me, that they're all incredibly hard to achieve, but, but the ones without carbon capture and storage are, uh, are definitely not possible. Uh, you know, we're, we're going to have to be actively removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, uh, and, and projects like Oxys are the first step to doing that. Um, I think on the oil company side, well, you know, the oil companies, as I said, they're getting into solar power and, and, and uh, offshore wind and, and electricity retail and so on. A lot of stuff that, that has a, a limited connection to their core business. Whereas carbon capture and storage is absolutely their core business. You know, it's about taking fluids out of the ground and putting them back into the ground and, and chemical processing and so on. Um, it's, it's exactly the same as, as, uh, as a lot of their existing business in oil, oil and gas. If you talk about making hydrogen from natural gas, which is another big area of opportunity for them, that has to be done with carbon capture and storage as well to be clean. Um, so this is a, absolutely a big opportunity for all the, the major oil companies. 
And we know, you know, Exxon uh, has been often for a long time the world's largest carbon capture company, um, not for environmental reasons, but for, for enhanced oil recovery. Um, but the European majors increasingly getting into these projects. ADNOC, of course, has had a, uh, the world's first commercial scale industrial carbon capture project at uh, Masafa on, on a steel plant. Um, Aramco has, uh, has a large uh, enhanced oil recovery project using carbon dioxide. So the Middle East companies are, are already players in this space as well. And we've seen some pretty ambitious announcements from ADNOC over the next few years uh, to be capturing 5 million tons of CO2 a year. And that's an important uh, commitment for them to go through with. And indeed, I think we're seeing that, as you say, from every company out there. So it's maybe time to, to revisit and have a read back on your book. Um, before we leave you, uh, bring me sort of, uh, give us a feel for what companies really need to do for the end of the year. Where really there's not a whole lot, I suppose, that can happen at the minute. And I suppose the best case scenarios, everybody is hoping and looking for that. Um, from now until December, till the end of the year, we still have you know, that final quarter to go. Anything can happen. Winter's coming in Europe. We're seeing some signs of COVID coming back. But again, you know, what would be the best case scenario, I suppose, for the oil companies out there and for the producers? Well, look, I think the recovery is going to be slow and patchy. There may be a vaccine, you know, an effective vaccine. Let's hope there is soon. Um, nevertheless, that'll take time to roll out. So I don't think we'll see the mass lockdowns that we had earlier in the year, but we'll see patchy and rolling lockdowns and we'll continue to see uh, this worry weighing on economic growth and on demand growth. So the oil companies have got to bear in mind a you know, probably a recovery in demand, but a rather slow and halting one. And they'll have to be flexible, you know, opportunities arise in certain countries and then disappear in others. Uh, that again, the trading divisions will be very important. Um, gas market has picked up a little bit after, you know, a, a very soft period. Uh, so I think the companies will really have, have to say, well, this is kind of, you know, the new normal. Um, let's hope it's not a new normal that lasts very long, but, but, yeah, but it may do. So they have to run their businesses on this basis that the oil price may be hovering around 40, 45 for quite a long time. That's survivable for most companies. It's not comfortable. So, that, but they will have to get to a stage where they're able to invest again, uh, at least in the highest quality projects. Um, and, you know, we've seen Norway, for example, with some tax incentives and there has actually been more activity in Norway. So, you know, there are places that, that, uh, where investment can go ahead but with the best projects. Obviously, you know, we've been through a big round of cost cuts and, and job cuts, and, and that's still continuing. Um, but the companies are going to have to uh, try and rebuild their businesses for businesses that can run effectively under these kind of conditions, potentially for an extended period, but also have the optionality that if there is, there is a recovery, and let's say US shale production is, is falling, prices are recovering, that they're able to take advantage of that too and, and get back into an investment mode. Um, you know, that's a kind of general observation for the industry, but obviously we then have that, that dichotomy between the, the US companies, the Europeans and, and, the, and the Middle East national companies in terms of their low carbon strategies as well. Yeah, so really it is, it's very challenging times out there for everybody, but again, I think everyone looking at, and a very dynamic time in the industry. It's, it's in many ways quite an exciting time to see what's going on and you having written so much about it and looking back and looking forward, it is, it's an interesting time without a doubt, but for the companies, obviously it's, you know, keeping their eyes straight ahead and just getting through this. But I think we're seeing that right across the world in all sectors, but particularly in the energy sector too. Robin, I really want to thank you for your insight and for your expertise. Thanks for taking the time. Thanks for sharing it with us. We're really happy that you've taken the time to join us. Sure. Thank you. And again, just to all of our viewers out there, thank you so much for joining us. This has been the Adipec Energy Dialogues. Brought to you by Adipec, of course, in the run-up to Adipec Virtual in 2020. Registration is open right now, so be sure to go to adipec.com and join us. But we'll keep bringing you up to date with Adipec Energy Dialogues. And for me, Ethna Trainer, and all of the team at the Adipec Energy Dialogues, thank you so much for being with us.